music is evolving. We don't have many of the legends left, like Mr. Carter, to pass on that sound and that perspective. Always good to see you. Have you been everything good? good? Yes, sir. Good, good. But that's the point, right? That it keeps evolving and it keeps moving. And yeah, we have people like Mr. Carter to take those chances to push it. Right now I'm at the Birdland. Having a good time with pulling 16 people along with me. The 16 guys who have 16 different sets of problems. That's what the life is. They got, you know, they got families, they got bills, they got car stuff, you know? And I was disappointed that I can't find any work for these people outside of New York. You know, it's expensive. Airfare is expensive. Uh, they got other jobs that pay them much better than I can pay them. As soon as we get some light here, we'll be able to make some comfortable noise. Is there light back there on the stand? Do you need, you need more light? A yes, a yes, wait, a yes or no? No, okay. not me. Okay. Everybody else has suffered. Okay, I'm good with that. <laughs> As musicians, we don't have a career without an audience. I'm a musician without an audience. I don't have a career as a musician without an audience. So a lot of musicians right now are doing everything they can to figure it out. You know what I mean? How to survive, you know, with, with a lack of places to play, you know, and to, to learn your craft and learn your skill. I remember when Miles and Gil Evans played Carnegie Hall, the excitement in the community, the excitement in New York was so high. And it was incredible to be just in that block, in the block of Carnegie Hall. Everyone we saw was streaming, going to Carnegie Hall to hear Miles and Gill, my man and my man, you know? Uh, that excitement, it seems to be limited, limited to fewer people. I can't imagine this view of seven years ago. I can't imagine being this high in the building. <laughs> 10 years old when you have a two-story house in the yard and this is so far from, it's amazing. When you're that young, uh, it's the thing about playing music, becoming famous and, and being Highly respected in the industry and having accolades are not a part of that process. Be careful. Huh? Yeah, but just get it in there. We got, we got three gigs to make this sucker work. But to be away 60 years and all the things you knew to be your landmarks, like trees, a playground, the dusty streets that are now paved. It kind of takes you to another zone that's no longer my neighborhood. <laughs> it becomes the neighborhood. Look, this is the hardest part of playing the bass, man, changing the strings. And then you find the string doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. If the string is made well, it can last you for a year, no matter how much you're playing, you do on it. And the uh, strings are like $400 a set now. And it's just difficult for young guys who are trying to find out what string fits their bass, fits their sound. That kind of experimentation for young players is expensive. Since you can't work in New York all the time, you have to go out and where, where the work is, we're forced to travel. And one of the difficulties with traveling so much is you get in the car at 3 o'clock in the morning with a two-hour ride to the airport to be at the airport two hours before our flight time. We have a two-hour ride to the hotel. We finally get to our rooms, go to a sound check, maybe stay there for an hour before the concert starts. Concert meets over by 9.30 or so. Pack up the gear and make sure the music is all put away and the instruments are all safe and secure. And more likely than not, the next night, we have a flight somewhere to somewhere else. They call it electric bass tune this way, a ton of bass. I don't know. I like to pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> Having said all of that, 
My favorite thing is to enjoy going to work every night, trying to find the right notes to make these guys I'm playing with get to a different level. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> Okay, this is a gift, a birthday present from, uh, from, uh, it's okay, Lenny White and um, my dear friend Stanley Clark. Now, the airlines made it very difficult and impossible, as a matter of fact, to get our base in the cargo hold and in the plane was out of the question. And so we all have to go to this base du jour. And that means whatever base the promoter provided, we were kind of stuck with that to make this gig. And uh, Stanley and Lenny wanted my case that I should have one of these, and I never got around to it, you know. So their gift to me was this instrument, which is a, it sounds really very good. Um, it allows me to have my bass, and all I gotta do is find the right notes with a little less trouble than I would if it were not my bass. Hey, man, how are you, man? I'm doing good every day. You know, I'm a better bass player because of you. Good every day. Me too. I, did. I went, I went, I did, I did uh, a record date a few weeks ago. I knocked it out in one take. One take. Brandy? You were in Japan too, huh? Got back Sunday night about 8 o'clock. Right. And uh, basically hugged my wife, okay. changed suitcases, went to Montreal for a one-night concert. The next day? Yeah. Okay. Two days. Maybe. So you've been home just chilling since then. Well, I changed three light bulbs. You know. That's okay. You're doing home. Bought a new broom. Stuff, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You do. <laughs> <laughs> when you get home, you have honeydews to do, yeah, right? Yes, I do. Exactly. Honey does too. Yeah, accident. <laughs> We're all in that same boat, right? You know. Exactly. Exactly. You did. The the music's over. You got it, honey. You got to do this, honey. You got to do that, right? Yeah, buy some more, buy some more soap powder. Yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons. We, the jazz community, travel to Europe and Japan all the time. Is that the venues that were available 20 years ago in the States, they're not available for the jazz community. Right. Now, you, bands like yours with this big population following you, you can play the 20,000 seat auditoriums and 18,000 seats. Speaking for my part of the jazz community, we really admire that these guys have been able to maintain such a high level of performance and presentation that their fans from 1990 will still come to see them expecting to be entertained royally in the 18,000 seat hall. That right. just fascinates me. You know, when I go on stage, you know, you know, I'm playing for the people that were there before me. I'm playing for Ron, I'm playing for Miles. We drove from New York to East St. Louis for the first gig with the new band. And so when I go up there, I take all the spirits with me, you know, all that stuff, that tradition of bass playing, the artistry of it, you know, because I'm doing that too, you know what I mean? And I'm doing that because I had the opportunity to meet somebody like Ron and to be inspired and, you know, and then when I come to New York, I come over and, and just hanging out is just great. Because I'm going to go back and tell all the guys in the band, so what you, what you, you do to know today? what you talked about. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So it's an honor for me to to know him and I admire him and respect him, love him like a brother and great mentor for me. Speed it up. I'm going to circle this page for you. Okay. Play this one. This, this, uh, this is a, a funk okay. line. Take a look at it at home. Okay. You know, it reminds me to, to honor the instrument and, and be blessed and be grateful too, you know? You know, we picked a nice instrument or we picked us, you know? So I have my homework. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. Okay, I love you, okay. Love you this is great. Yeah.